up everybody my name is james d fiori and this is blackball the klondike papers what an evolution uh that document has seen since it was released earlier this year at first people kind of didn't know what to make of it i was actually one of those people even though i was directly in contact with with the people that put it out including my guest today uh, it was it was it was just difficult for me to to wrap my head around it. In fact, it was around the summertime while I was dealing with the Klondike papers, and I think I, I said it on air uh, maybe last week. It made me realize that I don't think I'm a journalist anymore. In fact, I know I'm not, and that's fine. Um, a journalist would have taken those Klondike papers and just sat with it for like two weeks and just parceled it out and went to town on it. Uh, I, you know, I don't have that. I, I don't. Ha- I have that skill set. I don't have the patience for that skill set, and so. What happened was um, people like Justin Ling, Canadian journalist, uh, started really amplifying the idea that this was a document of conspiracy theories, that this was a document perpetrated by a con man, and that this was a document that we shouldn't trust at all. Um, I'm paraphrasing Justin if he didn't say exactly that, whatever. But the idea of a conspiracy theorist sort of dossier uh, was starting to take hold. There was a couple of stories that were published by Press Progress, I think one by the CBC, but really the weight of that document wasn't felt until recently. And that was when this came out. Ratfucker, the Candleman podcast by Jesse Brown. In it, he deta- I've, I've only actually heard episode one, but in it, he details the sort of genesis of the Klondike Papers, who David Wallace is, and, um, you know, why editors and reporters were having a, a tough time trying to square the circle of a whistleblower blowing a whistle on many of the things that he did himself. And then things got really crazy when this happened. Calgary conservatives plotted to entrap and oust Mayor Nenshi in big store con scheme. And this is why we have this guest here today. Like the, the the engagement that this man brings is, is insane. He's sort of like he's almost like a celebrity, um, and uh, I'm happy to have him back. Here's David Wallace. David, how are you, buddy? Not too bad. How are you? I am under the weather. Me too. I am on so much like cough medicine and uh, Tylenol and all this shit. So I'm going to be like you know, letting you do most of the talking like a good journalist would do, even though I'm not a journalist. Um, so we'll we'll just deal with that as it comes. Um, how's your week been, David? <laughs> it's been rather uh, interesting. I'm, yeah. Uh, I listened. Uh, Ratfucker um, was uh, quite an episode. Um, extremely well produced and uh, pretty much got to the heart of the matter, at least the surface of it. Some of the underlying stuff is yet to be told. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was pretty compelling. I had Jesse Brown on last week, and uh, I thought it was a, it was a good discussion. I liked the um, I liked the exchange that we had about you, because and I've had this exchange with you, so it's not like going to come as a, as a surprise to you. But I think it was back in June. I was talking to you on the phone, and I was like, you know, the amazing thing about this is that is it's almost paradoxical for some people that a person who had a job where um, their honesty is sort of always in question because that's the job. And then um, to find that person credible after having a career like that is difficult for some people. And I get that. I understand that. I understand why. Um, I remember saying to you at the time, I think we need to like focus, like tunnel vision on that aspect and almost use that as your brand, uh, you know, in a way, because, you know, you're lifting the curtain on the things that you've done yourself. And then all of the corruption that lives around you in that world you know, um, and the receipts were there in the Klondike papers. People didn't know how to piecemeal it together. And then when this came out, Calgary considered plotted to entrap and oust Marinenshi and Big Store Con scheme. 
we started to see the first, that was basically, I would say the first big story, uh, or at least it was bigger than the uh, uh, Doug Ford Russian businessman story, I think. Um, and so that, that broke what, like a, not quite a week ago, I guess, or about four or five days ago. How has the reaction been? Has there been any weird blowback? Tell me. Tell me what I got doing. about three dozen phone calls on WhatsApp from Alan Holman uh, going back and forth. Um, I was more than happy to provide Mr. Holman with some shit so he could go and tear into some of my other enemies, such as Jonathan Dennis and the other uh, people I'm rat fucking. Uh, I'm basically giving them back their business. I enjoy I watching you. animals uh, chew themselves to death. I love how you've reached the stage now where not only have you gotten Alan Holman to go after Jonathan Dennis, but you just announce it on a live podcast because fuck it. You know? Well, because they're criminals. And, um, yeah. you know, I think it's important to understand once all of the pieces of this story come out, people might see me much differently. Um, pertaining to Alan Holman. Um, <clears throat> Explain for us the people in the audience who might not know who Alan Holman is. Alan Holman is the father of Chad Holman. Um, Chad Holman, um, I first reached out to him in 2018. He had been tracking me on social media and asking people who worked in Mayor Patrick Brown's camp, who he was familiar with, um, all sorts of questions. So I got a little bit curious. So I started uh, scouting out Mr. Holman. I was quickly able to suss out that himself, uh, um, well, not too uh, uh, criminal at that point. His father was a point man uh, in a massive criminal empire that was going on in Alberta. Um, chiefly the UCP uh, identity theft. And um, when I got there, um, I made Mr. Holman's uh, acquaintance. Uh, he was eager to hire me for a job. He claimed he was being harassed by certain members of the community. I uh, chased those claims down and found that he was indeed being harassed. However, um, further down the line, uh, during a drinking session, Mr. Holman produced screenshots from his WhatsApp uh, showing me the same people that I found to be harassing him. Well, it was mutual. So it was not a case of harassment. It was a case of two jerk offs winding each other's watches. <laughs> but he paid me very well. I just that. imagine hair getting caught in the watch. So I don't know. You know I'm, I'm, I'm sick. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But it was, uh, it was a case of uh, these people creating a lot of their own problems. Um, that was a problem for me. And, uh, Certain members of that community were targeted. Uh, Prem Singh, who was named in this story, mm. uh, Prem Singh was a target of Mr. Alan Holman. He uh, hired me to try to find out if a website, uh, which was launched, which was listing people who perhaps were involved in the UCP leadership, or excuse me, identity theft, um, putting up evidence that had been gathered by citizens. Um, he was determined to hunt that down. He had a real vendetta against Ms. Singh. Okay, the Nenshi story. Um, let's let's rehash uh, what's already been reported just to sort of get everyone up to speed. Um, the big store con. Uh, enc encapsulate that for us. What was the idea? Who thought of it? And how was the execution supposed to go? Well, <clears throat> I was given a packet of information on Mayor Nenshi that alleged severe criminality, not only from himself, but from developer friends and his counselors. Uh, certain counselors. So I had a list. Um, I was told that they were quote unquote whores for payoffs. So I decided that I needed an angle to get in. Um, Calgary can, was going through a fairly severe economic slump. Can I interrupt um, for one second? Because I, I just want to, I don't want to forget. Um, mayor Nenshi is probably the most well known mayor in Canada when he was still in office. Maybe Rob Ford or something was probably uh, more well known for all the most amazing reasons of all time. But if someone ever came to me, knowing what I know and, and, and have known for the last 10, 12 years about Nahid Nenshi, I would be like completely in disbelief that Nenshi was corrupt. Like it, it would be like, oh, okay. What kind of dossier or evidence, if any, did they show you to show that he was corrupt? There was no evidence. There were simply screenshots and papers, photocopies of contracts that had been awarded by the city. Uh, from the investigation I was able to do, they all went out to legal tender and the best bid won. I didn't mm -hmm. find any criminality that I could. Um, when I uh, did my workups on Mayor Nancy, they pointed out certain relationships, such as uh, relationships with Ismaili businessmen in the community. 
I met a great deal of those people um, during this job and uh, they were polite, honest, hardworking members of the community who were quite frankly, making the city and the province a better place. They, uh, they never solicited uh, uh, any payoffs. They were more than happy to show me their businesses and um, were quite helpful in trying to work with the city to put together uh, uh, some kind of bilateral trade agreement where a city in Russia could be chosen to be a sister city and trade could be initiated. So I didn't see any corruption. Um, I saw I'm systemic sorry, that, racism, but not, not corruption. Yeah, I was about to say that. Like, you know, to wrap my head around it, they wanted to take um, Calgary's first, I think maybe even, no, maybe just Calgary, Calgary's first Muslim mayor and tie him to businesses owned by other people of color only <laughs> to, try, to try to use their existence as a way to sort of convince you that he was corrupt with these businesses? They gave me a tape too, a, a, a audio file um, of a cab ride that he had taken, uh, where apparently they said there were controversial comments where he uh, said he hated, didn't hate, but he disliked certain developers and that they were assholes. Uh, from my own research, he was right. Maybe he could have been a little bit more eloquent in public, but uh, he certainly chose the right adjectives. I, for one, am shocked that developers turned out to be a little bit of jerks. You know, that's, that's surprising a to me. Bit. A little yeah. bit. Okay. So um, tell us then how, uh, like, we can skip like the details that kind of like what might confuse people. But once you sort of get things into place, were you at any meetings with um, with the main players and Prem and all that kind of stuff? And what was that like? And, and, and what is it like? This is the kind of the question that I want to ask you. Um, also, just to let people know, you, David Wallace is going to have a podcast on the Dean Blundell Network in a couple of weeks. It's called The Fix. These are the kind of questions that I want to ask you. When you're sitting in a room like that, and they are all there, essentially due to a figment of your imagination that you have shared with them to make sure that they are there, are you kind of reading the room and sort of like looking for opportunities to freestyle a little bit? Or are you just sticking to the plan? Like, how does that work from the point of view? You always have to adapt and roll with it. I mean, it's a, it's a real world situation. The map is not the territory. My initial conversation was with Prem Singh, Shane Wenzel, and uh, Edith Wenzel it was via telephone in June, excuse me, late May, early June of uh, 2019. Um, I laid out my scenario on how we could protect, uh, uh, perhaps entrap Mayor Nenshi. Um, I won't use that word entrap. What I'll use is uh, find something compromising. Uh, they said that if he's guilty, which they believed he was, that he would go for the bait. So I designed the scenario and told them that I knew a group of Russian businessmen and uh, political staff that I could bring in to do a dangle, meaning I would present legitimate investment opportunity and um, i would leave the suspicion that there was sanctioned money hanging in the air i, I didn't need to vocalize it i simply well put a the 40 billion the 40 billion itself would have been the <laughs> the kind of red flag for those guys right like Absolutely. that's a lot of money well it was set up that way simply so it seemed astronomical so they would question its veracity at that point it would give them an opening to ask me for whatever right Okay. Um, and then how did it fall apart? Well, it fell apart because I met the RCMP. Um, hmm. Nenshi wouldn't take the bait. The only people who seemed to be ensnared in the dangle were counselors who were friendly and part of the circle of the people that hired me. Um, those counselors continued to parade businessmen and local businesses before me and had me take tours, solicited me to invest in pot shops and, uh, a variety of other um, very unusual recreational facilities. Um, they got in the way. That's what they did. And uh, instead of organically pushing the invitation, they decided to jump the gun. And I was never okay with it. I thought it was stupid. It would drive the quarry further away, but they couldn't help themselves. I, I, I'm see. I'm just right now remembering something. And there's a common thread between the Richard Marsh story and this one. And for me, that is the during the Richard Marsh stuff. I don't remember if it was Gerald Shapur or Brad Mitchell, but someone told you that Richard Marsh had an outstanding criminal warrant. Yes, and then in this, and Mr. Jacobson, that right, which is a complete fabrication. 
Yes. And then in this situation, someone told you that Nenshi was corrupt. Is that something that happens a lot to convince people to do certain jobs? Or is that just a coincidence that I'm seeing? No, it's all the time. I mean, uh, usually with my clients, they tend to frame their targets in the most unflattering light. I mean, I take it all with a grain of salt because I start from the assumption that all politicians are corrupt. That's just, uh, I know it's jaded, but it's... Probably a safe play. <laughs> but it turns out that not all politicians are corrupt. No. Nope. So, uh, and then she would have been uh, literally, if someone said, what three politicians are not corrupt? I, he, I would have been like, Nahid Nenshi, Nathaniel Erskine Smith. And I think that's it. <laughs> no, I couldn't get that guy to do anything. I mean, I met him at two or three functions, shook his hand, brought it up, and he referred me always to city staff and economic development. And uh, uh, that's when I met uh, John Car. Well, I met John Carlo Carra at dinner, but uh, he kind of took the lead on it and showed me around. And uh, then he interacted with the uh, Russian uh, foreign ministry staff and the consul general and uh, it just went away. My belief is it went away because of the counselors who were pushing for an official visit behind the mayor's back. They shot themselves in the foot. Yeah. So then, okay. So let's get to uh, one aspect of the story that Press Progress wrote about today. Yes. I'm just going to read a little bit from that. <clears throat> With my, uh, I always say that when, when my voice starts to get hoarse, I feel like Demi Moore's bastard. And that's how I feel right now. So by the time I get to the end of this paragraph, I'm going to be probably sounded like Walter Matthau or something. But anyways, so it says, R RCMP knew of alleged plot to entrap Calgary mayor. Audio recording suggests. Phone calls suggest conservative political fixer may have acted as a foreign intelligence source. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police appear to have knowledge, appear to have had knowledge over two years ago about an alleged, alleged plot to entrap former Calgary mayor, <coughs> Eddie Menchie. A case Calgary police announced this week is the focus of an of an active criminal investigation. The alleged entrapment plot called Operation Peacock involves several conservative insiders, developers, and a described political fixer. One, David Wallace. So um, there was that one part of that where I asked you today to explain to me what it means, foreign intelligence source. What does that mean? Uh, well, when I met uh, uh, the constable, um, the RCMP constable, it was uh, we had a discussion and uh, then we had a further discussion and it was decided that um, I would um, give them information on foreign situations in an unofficial capacity. Um, I had done likewise in Ontario with the policing agencies. I had been doing so for several years, starting with the Patrick Brown setup when I was in Moscow. Uh, in 2017, uh, I attended a hockey game uh, that week in St. Petersburg, and I was given a file folder uh, about the Patrick Brown job. At that point, I called a mutual friend of myself and Patrick Brown and uh, warned him what was coming. Um, then he was removed. My phone rang a couple of days later, and uh, it was basically all about casino money. And those casino interests had their roots all the way back in Russia through an Israeli Russian crime family. Yeah. It's so shit. Do you remember the first time we had you on the Dean Blundell show? And I, I think Lachlan was like, he, he was just like, he, like visibly shocked about what he was hearing and trying to figure out what you were and how to make heads or tails of it. You, you know, uh, this might be part for the course for you, but this is really intriguing to those of us who are not political fixers um you know how you can you have this neat gift of being able to insert yourselves your insert insert yourself into a situation and then just sort of become like the um intermediary between a whole bunch of people um it, you know it's because the Nahid Nenshi thing that was your brainchild wasn't it well the job itself was and I mean I was recruited for it um mm. In the, one of the articles, they mentioned that I reached out to Charlie Holman first. I did in 2018, nothing to do with Calgary. I was simply asking why he was tracking me. I found it interesting. In my line of work, it doesn't pay to be tracked. Um, but then you can see the next communication in the chain. Chad reached out to me and brought up the Save Calgary and the uh, Olympic bid. And if I had any dirt on counselors, and that's when discussion began that uh, perhaps I could put together a plan and he would raise the money and bring me into Calgary to remove the mayor. Okay. How did the RCMP get the tapes that they've had for two years? How did they get the tapes? Yeah. Um, 
I had made Mr. Hallman's acquaintance, Alan Hallman, uh, shortly after I came to Calgary. We had messaged back and forth on a social media platform. He said that I was no snowflake and uh, he was glad to have me there and perhaps we could get together. Hold on. Um, <laughs> he opened his buttering up of David Wallace by... Hey, pal! You're not how a are snowflake. you, pal? Hey, how are you, not buddy? A snowflake. Yeah. Everybody knows when Alan wants to take him for a beer, it's either to threaten them or to... Uh, to ingratiate yeah. himself. And Alan needs two stools because he man spreads so proudly, right? Like he just takes there two. There you go. Well. <laughs> so we met up and he gave me several small jobs, again, about people who were harassing him, about websites for people who were former UCP uh, members, he claimed, who were sour grapes. Um, but we got a lucky break. Um, I was tracking money from Russia that was making its way into the United States and then was being washed to a place called Grand Prairie in the uh, uh in alberta through a religious uh, um, organization um there was an individual named spike martins i was told was handling the money wash and that was overseas uh we tracked down several businesses where money was mysteriously appearing from overseas i shared that intelligence um mr holman then graduated um he told me over several sessions that he had nothing to do with the UCP identity theft. Um, then he started sharing WhatsApp uh, messages between himself and a man named uh, Preb Gill and some others, um, which painted a totally different picture. Uh, when I asked him further, he said that they did the job that, uh, and then that they got rid of them. Um, they used them and then uh, set them up and tossed them aside. And I believe that those individuals, uh, or at least people close to them, made the initial complaint to the RCMP. So what I did was I told the cop who I was meeting for the first time, the RCMP cop, that Alan Holman wanted me to tape him so he could get evidence to drop to what he described as his buddy uh, detective in the Calgary Police Department, and that they would take care of the rest. Their overall goal was to derail the UCP identity theft investigation and have a reason politically to remove the RCMP from the province of Alberta to install their own Alberta police force. Your sound. Alan Holman doesn't really strike me as a guy who's really careful. Well, he thought I was one of them. And, uh, you know, several years prior, I had been one of them. I had my own, I had my own reasons for doing these things. I've been determined since, uh, well, for a long time that I'm going to take as many of these sons of bitches off the map as I can because they are bad people. These are the same people who go into a community like Calgary um, and they prey on these people, this, uh, this community, um, the same people, and they know who I'm talking about. And the racism, uh, it's not like that here in Ontario. I mean, James, you're here. I mean, it's just... To me, it's like these people were spoken of as second-class human beings, let alone citizens. And I saw how they were used and then thrown aside like condoms. It was uh, now granted they weren't they weren't one hundred percent clean, but they weren't the real problem. The it's real problem is condoms, David. The real problem is that during the course of Mr. Hallman doing his backgrounding, I found that the friends that he introduced me to, such as the former. Uh, Solicitor General Jonathan Dennis, several local businessmen, council members, uh, former MLAs. This was a criminal enterprise. We had had allegations of judges' wives being murdered. Uh, we had had allegations of court cases being fixed, of a former deputy premier being framed and set up. This was all information that I was extremely interested in, and I made it a personal responsibility on my part to try to make sure that these people were caught. And when I saw the opportunity, I made sure that the cop was bugged, the RCMP, he knew about it, and then they turned the tape into his detective friend, and then we found out exactly who we suspected in the Calgary Police Department might be his buddy. And uh, shortly afterwards, as a result of the fallout of that, Alan Holman called his friends at the RCMP who were acting for the other side and arranged to have witness statements, which were on two uh, recorders left at his home, which I tipped off the RCMP about the good side of the RCMP, not the rogue cops. <laughs> Steve Morrissey, who's now on leave with the RCMP, the guy's a fucking hero. He's a clean cop. They tried to set him up. And he alone has been interested in bringing the people responsible for this identity theft to justice. 
And I damn sure hope that he doesn't get himself in trouble for this with either his policing agency or, or any lawyers, because at the, at the end of the day, that guy's got more credibility and more honor in his fucking pinky than this entire city has. And if you didn't actually tip the RCMP uh, about that, would this would this story even exist? Like, how would it Probably exist? Not. No, 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 it wouldn't. They were... The RCMP was surprised the whole way on, on how things were progressing again because it was not their jurisdiction. They said they would let other law enforcement uh, 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 that was um, wired in for that. They would let them know and give them the intelligence. However, I was operating uh, by that point underneath, uh, uh, well, a designation so that my identity could be protected when I was overseas. What did it feel like when you, at the moment that you made the decision not to hand over Richard Marsh to the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church? I, I sort of imagine it as a coming to Jesus moment, only without the clearly fictional omnipotent being. Um, but you seem to have that sort of like uh, complete reversal of ethics. Well, a lot of it had to do with some of the cash that we tracked down that was flowing from overseas that turned out to be going through coffers of businesses, religious businesses. And one of those businesses caught my eye. It was uh, underneath the family tree of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church and their uh, business team. So right away, I saw that it was all interconnected. It's a very small community of thieves in Alberta. Yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit uh What's funny about uh, this story, by the way, is that I knew about it months ago. Um, and again, it was like I had so much stuff going on. I just never, you know, bothered with it. But the Danielle Smith angle to this story, which you discussed a little bit when you're on the Dean Blundell show, uh, that we sort of, that you told me about months ago, it, it was light, right? On the evidence. Yeah. She I mean, I mean, I met the woman. I met yeah, the woman. She, she, she was supposed to be the friendly media that would break the story if the Nenshi uh, big store con or whatever it's called uh, was successful. Is that basically it? That's what I was told. And when I did meet her, I mean, the woman looked right through me. She's, yes, nice to meet you. Great. Thanks a lot. I mean, she, uh, I don't even know if she took much notice of any of us. I mean, so she certainly didn't uh, want to break down a discussion and go into details. So, um, yeah. I believe I'm that surprised she, that she even went there. I believe that she was one of a number of journalists that they had identified as possible uh, friendly media that were ready, willing and able to drop. I mean, because the way it was explained to me, she was planning a run for mayor if then she stepped down and was removed. God, there's people that are just like and Patrick Brown's one of these people and Danielle Smith appears to be one of these people where they're just like. I don't give a fuck where it is. I just want to be getting paid, yo, uh, by being like a leader politically so I can then do shady shit. Like it's just carpetbaggers. That's what I call them. The problem is with our politicians today is that they have no moral compass at all in any way, shape or form. People can say that I'm a dark individual. They can say that I set these people up and I did set them up, but you can't be set up unless you step onto the court and you're willing to play. I don't invite myself. You got to knock at the door and bring me in. If they're crying now because they think I took advantage of them because they wanted to uh, order the commission of crimes, multiple crimes, then not only are they stupid, they're also yeah. they're also I don't even want to know how they reason through problems, because to me, it's 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 absolutely mental. They see themselves well, as the victims. Well, yeah, though, at least that's the strategy that they go by to try to defend themselves. I mean, they did this also, like, oh, and then they have the nicknames, like, what was it, Jabba and the Lips or whatever those people Yeah, are Hot Lips and uh, uh, yeah. the Hot. You know, I mean, they're probably right thing. now, they're probably right now sitting in, in like Jonathan Dennis's garage with a Scarface poster in the corner, you know, calling you a fucking rat and all this stuff, even though they spent their entire lives scamming Canadians of our attack money, <laughs> right? Like Absolutely. And I'm yeah. no rat. I was acting as a volunteer source of information from overseas, our enemies. Part of that uh, information was a cache of documents that was dropped to me, a box from the former press secretary of the Russian Federation, Kirill Kalanin, who has made yeah. a personal vendetta against our deputy premier, Krishka Freeland, his life's mission. It led to him being removed. That propaganda was turned over to the RCMP, 
uh, so it never saw the light of day. Same information that Alan Holman asked me if it was for sale. Yeah, here's the thing about that. I, I always got stuck on that story, the Christopher Freeland grandfather one, like this. Who fucking cares? I don't fucking care if her fucking grandfather was Hitler. What does that have to do with her? You know, it has like, nothing to do with it, but that's the problem. It's got you politics. It's something that I worked in for decades. Got you politics. If you comport yourself decently and don't break the law, there's nothing to get. Nothing. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. Be a decent person. The problem is right now we're engaging in identity politics that that have no basis in reality. What we need to do is you're either a decent human being who's looking for a progressive, equitable world, or you are someone who wants to enrich yourself and your friends and keep everybody else down. And that seems to be the problem right now. People are saying, I'm liberal, I'm conservative. We have to stop identifying ourselves by those labels and we need to identify ourselves as Canadians and work together and stop this hatred we need to understand. I mean, when I grew up, I grew up in Scarborough as a little kid. I had a Greek kid on the block. I had an Italian kid on the block, Portuguese kids. Nobody notices. I mean, that's yeah. what Canada is all about. Well, it's about diversity. Until you, their houses, until you go to their houses, you realize there's a distinct difference between the Italian kitchen and fucking Portuguese. Well, the food was phenomenal. Yeah. But uh, yeah. what I'm saying is that's what Canada is. We are all immigrants. We're here and we're a melting pot. This is a country that... Where, where we care for the old, for the sick, where we stand up when things are wrong. This is a country where we 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 do the right thing. And and to see this, it's got to yeah. stop. You know, it's funny, though, because civil engagement has been bad in this country for quite a while. And then we have elections here and there where the turnout is crazy. Um, I think the, the, the second election that Rob Forge... I don't know if he won it or lost it, but whatever. That that voter turnout in Toronto was crazy. It was, it was really high. Ontario had a thirty three point or thirty three percent turnout. He and Doug Ford was elected to eighteen percent of the votes. It's a strategy. It's a strategy that the uh, like even the Knesset leading party in Israel gets more <laughs> percentage, higher percentage than that. You know, like it's it, it's 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 crazy. And the weird thing about it is, is that politics, as far as uh, people being engaged in issues has probably never been higher. Absolutely. But it's a strategy. It's a strategy that is quite as effective. It's uh, it's to smother things. I mean, you you want low voter turnout because without low, to, low voter, in, they can't win. That's the problem. And unfortunately, in Ontario, due to timing and, uh, and fundraising issues, there was no alternative. I mean, there really wasn't anybody to vote for who had enough time to really make an imprint on the public's consciousness. So Mr. Ford got very lucky. Um, there's a lot of things going on beside this, behind the scenes in this country. Uh, people were wondering why I was so confident that there was a member of the prime minister's staff who was tipping off the convoy. You remember I made that claim months ago. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I was so confident is because we had my own, I had my own snitches in the unit. That's right. why. And I, I heard some very trouble. How big is the unit? A dozen guys? Like, are you sure you want to say that? <laughs> what I'm saying that. is, yeah. what I'm saying is, it was very clear there was a case of divided loyalties in our policing uh, services. Divided loyalties. Doesn't that sound hilarious, though, David? Like, divided loyalties. What does that really mean when you unpack it? Well, it means that one side was loyal to uphold the law and protecting the community, and the other side was loyal to themselves. Like, that is a very... You know, that's a cultural thing, right? Like when you're looking at it like that, like this you know, was this how do you keep secret with eight with eight people. Like for example, how do you can how do you keep that secret? Well, everyone's got to have dirt on their hands and money in their pockets, right? Like, that's right. Yeah. That is correct. It was, uh, but this this uh, ideological crisis was motivated by uh, was motivated by uh, anti mandate people. It was motivated by people who want to turn this into a racial issue. It was motivated by people who, quite honestly, didn't even know why they were there. Many of them. They were simply there because they don't like how things are going. And they were used. They were used like pawns from that point. You see these puppets going before the inquiry, and they have no idea still that they got completely played. They're taking the flack and holding the bag. The foreign-funded actors who set this in motion are gone. And that's how it Oh, goes. I thought they were like... Fictional. 
<laughs> it's really good. This is straight money, and this is flowing through many, many uh, uh, fronts, religious fronts, uh, political action groups. It's a mess, and it needs to be dismantled now because our democracy is being stolen one day at a time. And that's why you're doing the fix. I, I, I love it when we have our phone meetings and we talk about what uh, an, a general episode is, is going to look like. And, and I don't think we've nailed it, nailed it yet, but like, um, and just I, uh, at an overarching sort of way to describe the show, I think I said this when Jesse Brown was on the show. I've been looking at it, I've been telling you this. As a show, it's like the political fixer equivalent to a show that would just give away all the magic tricks from really good magicians. Absolutely. And I love that. It's such a disruptor, you know, like it really is. It disrupts everything too. It disrupts politics, obviously. It disrupts the minds of Canadian voters who don't know about any of this shit. It disrupts the media because how do you rat fuck somebody um, effectively when you have a universal uh, uh, integral kind of way of, of fucking this person over? You need a journalist. You you need a Daniel Smith, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's an easy process, though. I mean, because you need to rely on these people whose greed and criminality, um, like Alan Holman and Vitor Marciano and others reaching out to me during the uh, leadership vote for uh, which Danielle ultimately won. Um, I had four fixers ask me to take down the other candidates. I told them all, I'll take them all down. I'd love to. As many people in the United yeah. Criminal Predators Party as I can, I'll take them down. They're, I'm retired. I've blown the whistle. I'm on the news every day, and they're still reaching out for me. I mean, it's so absolutely funny. insane. Like hiding in plain sight. You're doing a press conference, but you're really on a job. <laughs> these, these people are, I mean, that's the beauty. I mean, do they think I'm going to change course and stop blowing the whistle? I mean, I'll be more than happy to destroy all of them because the truth is they're all criminals. Have you ever had a situation where you were hired by more than one people and they represented opposite sides? Absolutely. The, uh, oh. the Patrick Brown job, I mean, the job was oh, yeah. done. Right. Um, then they hired me to get him back in or at least find out the source. So I was, uh, I knew where it came from, of course, but it led to all kinds of interesting things, including the, uh, uh, the original. Well, it from you, didn't it? What's that? It came from you, didn't it? Well, part of it did absolutely. I was hired by it. That's you're like, the, the you're casino like, answers. You're like the guy in Shawshank Redemption. Um, uh, oh no, you're the, you're the, like the ex CIA guy who was uh, given an entire department to investigate how, how to find this Russian mole. The CIA knew a Russian mole was inside the CIA, and the guy that they gave the director's chair to to investigate all this was the mole so for, so for years he had to orchestrate this whole thing and, and to, to investigate himself to try to find himself kind of thing but anyways um i i just find it really intriguing like this is the exact kind of topic that um excites me about this i'm still of the mind that if you if you did like a convention 500 canadians came and and it was explained to them with facts and maybe ex-politicians to confirm things and staffers and all that. And so the credibility is established about what can what campaigns do to each other during elections, what parties do to each other during leadership campaigns. How, like the just the private investigator account alone is like ridiculous. And you know, threats and the blackmail. And the things that we don't hear about is probably the lion's share of all this shit. I, I'm, I'm certain it is, right? Well, absolutely. Well, one thing that you're intimately aware of, during the course of the Patrick Brown job, uh, a woman named Diana Davison was doing a series of videos. I was acting as a confidential source, and I got him back to a favorable rating in the press, as you remember. I gave her information, inside information that she used along with her own research, which was excellent and outstanding. I thought she was an outstanding journalist. She's a good researcher. For those who don't know, Diana Davis, um, kind of an outlier advocate for falsely accused men, um, to which the far left will normally paint her as a men's rights activist who blah, 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 hates women, blah, blah. Um, but she does meticulous research and she absolutely has, meticulous you know, research. Unfortunately, at this time, she developed a personal relationship with the late Joe Villeneuve, who is the yeah. former lawyer for the PC party in Ontario and uh, a very close personal friend of Patrick Brown's. And she developed a very close relationship with the Brown family. Yeah. She lost her objectivity. Um, 
Yeah, and Joe never actually uh, allowed the romantic part to. No, to it, which which bothered her. But then yeah. you saw the. Uh, you know. What then you saw the. Uh, uh, then she accepted payment. She accepted payment from the lawyer and me. That's and right. And that found way into Canada land, which undercut the credibilities of Brown's defense, thereby uh, sinking his boat. And that was yeah. how it was done. I, I, I found out like a year. I found out like a year later that a Canada land employee, like a reporter, had like a recording of me being like, because the, this was when uh, there was like a sedan that rolled by my house. It could have been completely innocuous. This happens to me only when you come into my life, by the way, David. Um, but what I was just thinking before is that when Diane and Joe and I were on a call, um, I said to them at one point, I don't know, guys, this fucking David guy, I can't fucking get heads or tails as to what he does or what he's doing or why he's so interested in giving me something. Like you were floating a book deal and shit. And like in hindsight, it's so funny to me. Like I'm not even offended because I was just like, oh, cool. I became like a, a fixer widget in the big project <laughs> that he was working on. Well, you played and, a valuable uh, role. You certainly helped me advance my agenda. I do. Yeah. <laughs> hey, no problem. I don't know. What did I do? I was the only reporter that didn't have to answer to an editor. So I just kept on publishing shit. Right? No, but that's a double-edged sword because Mr. Velenu and I, I thought, developed a better relationship after that took place. We uh, talked about several other issues. I provided him a recording that I made undercover of myself and Mr. Frank D'Angelo during the uh, Sherman family murder investigation. I had been retained to let's uh, not pivot. Let's not pivot too far into that at all. No, but you also know what I'm talking about. I gave him a tape, which yeah. he disseminated to Miss Davison, who gave it to Mr. Frank D'Angelo, and thereby blowing the investigation, at least that part of it. Yeah. Probably yeah. responsible at helping keep a murderer at large for these last several years. It was a and that's statement. where we end the Sherman conversation. There you go. Uh, yeah, then you know, but but well, tune into the fix because by tune then, into the fix might... because there'll be yeah. plenty. Okay, listen to me for a second because I want you to understand something. I told you before we went on air. When you wear your hair down, women love you. When you wear it back, men like you better because we don't. We're not so distracted by your hair. It's all in my we, face. Yeah, me either. Yeah, like that thing that you do where you're like, you know, nine and two and oh guy for a second, your hair back like that. I'm just like, oh, for fuck's sake, dude. <laughs> please. It's the only thing that's still gross. Listen, you have you have a beautiful man. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I like being bald, uh, but if I were to have hair, I'd probably get it like you just to see what it would feel like because I've never had hair like that. I had a like a Jufro, I think they call them, you know, like a frizzy white guy oh, yeah. kind of hair. Yeah, and it just grew this way. <laughs> it never grew down. So, you know, well, I'm, my I'm line of work, I try to look different. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is basically me. This is what I would be without it. I mean, for many decades, uh, I was, uh, um, well, I, I fit the part, but uh, it always pays to look a little different or a lot different, depending on where you are. Is there something that you want to get out of this podcast uh, almost therapeutically to sort of help that transition along into normal civilian life. Yeah, I want to. I want to. I want to show people the setups. I want to peek behind the curtain. I want to show you the wizard, and uh, I want to show you that well, these tricks happen, and that they're very well funded. Um, they're only effective because we don't see the sleight of hand. But when you pull back the curtain, it's easy to spot and you shut them down. I want to educate Canadians who will hopefully tune in to not only jobs that are already done, but uh, to the current real-time situations that are going on. We can present a situation, we can invite other people on, and I can say, this is the publicly available information, and this is our analysis and what we believe yeah. is going on. And then we will present uh, demonstrable facts which uh, support our argument, for entertainment purposes only, of course. Oh, of course, of course. And then we're going to have a sign. Let's not tell them about the sign yet. Sorry, guys. Uh, we're going to have a sign. It's going to be great. We'll do the unveiling of the sign in a week and a half or two weeks or so. Um, I will be with you at the start as we feel out the process. I have no expectations of remaining on the show. I want to be there for you as a producer and uh, a co-host here and there, whatever uh, it organically turns into. But I I'm really excited about it. Like people of Jesse Brown podcast were messaging me being like, Holy shit, man! You're gonna be like on the fix with David Wallace, and I'm like, I, like I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start him out, and then he's either gonna release me or ask me to stay. That's basically what it's gonna be, and I'll be like, whatever you want to do is totally fine, because I'll remain your producer, right? And um, we are going to like 
blow the lid of so many secrets that are open in politics, but closed to the rest of us. I don't know if people are going to even believe what we're saying. Well, you know what? Nobody believed me when they started, but seeing is believing. Yeah. Well, even the Patrick Brown stuff, like, 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 you know, at the time it was happening, I was like, this isn't real. I know this isn't real, you know? And it was, it's amazing. <laughs> you, you weren't even, you were in chess, but 3D chess with like eight people. Well, like I said, I'm not that smart, but I'm persistent and uh, I'm uh, a bit of a plotter. But it always uh, uh, pays to be patient. Yeah, it certainly does. Um, more stories are coming out. Uh, you anticipate more stories coming out from the Klondike paper, correct? Absolutely. Uh, I believe the next Radfucker episode will deal uh, exclusively with the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church and the adventure I was sent on when I got the cold call from Alan Holman, who put me in front with his buddy, Gerald Chapur. Yeah. Just that guy bears a striking point. resemblance to the leader of the opposition, doesn't he? Yeah, you keep saying that, and that's the kind of shit that just the Justin Lings of the well, world. Well, hey, like, Justin yeah. Trudeau's father's Castro, isn't he? So, no. hey, I got an idea. How about we no, all no. submit to a DNA test? No, no. Twitter data services only. No, you almost had the idea there. If you said this, we I, I have an idea. We should all find the celebrity that we look a little bit alike and make a T-shirt. Because, um, and I'm pretty sure the the Castro Trudeau one, the photo of Castro that they compared Trudeau to, two of the most famous ones, have already been put through that filter that combines two faces. Yep. That's why everyone thinks it looks so much like him. Um. So. Absolutely. Yeah, it's Absolutely. funny. And and just like. Christy Freeland's grandfather being a Nazi, I don't fucking care. I don't, what is it, communism in your blood? Like, really? Just past that I, I, I think the biggest problem we're all facing today is we've got to cut the bullshit. We've got a group of people at the very highest levels of power in the official opposition who have embraced anti science, who have embraced extremism, who have embraced a very dangerous tone which is permeating this country, and it's caused it to be set on the edge of ruin. We are merely at the tip of the iceberg of potential violence in this country. The, the convoy will look like nothing. The next, the next event will probably be much worse, and we need to stand up, and we need to stomp this out. We need to understand and let go of the corruption of the past and move forward so that every citizen, every citizen, has the equity in this society. We need to be a government of the people for the people. And that's the sides that are progressive, the sides that are that are trying to move us forward into new industries and new ways of doing things in ways that we won't murder the planet, in ways that children aren't starving in the streets, equitable distribution of wealth and education. These are the things we need to concentrate on. And Trudeau, I was never a liberal. And maybe I'm not a liberal now, but uh, I don't know about you. I'm going to vote for the side that is for education, that is for healthcare, that is for science. I'm going to vote for the people who see a better tomorrow. And there's no future by living in the past. And unfortunately, that's what our conservative movement is doing today. They're living in the past. It's got to. It's got to be done. It's got to be finished. I totally agree with you. I, I think um, I think they're living in the past. I think living in the past is a symptom of the problem, though. And I think the problem is that in the same way that they approach politics to try to enrich themselves and their friends, they see voters as target demographics, right? They, they see them as a means to an end, not, uh, you Absolutely. know, not, I, yeah, not ideas that they can glean and then sort of make something happen. That's positive for all of us. They just, they just want to use them. And so when the tea party stuff happened in the States, for me, that was like the beginning of kind of like the retailing of political, new political active people. And, you know, you basically get them as saplings, you know, people they've never been in politics before. And you give them all this information, it enrages them. And then they take that rage and they turn it into a political action. Yes. I, I'm like, in Canada, that, that would be the convoy. Um, and then you had like microcosmic examples of it, um, Ford Nation, yes, for example. You know, like the 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 
the labeling of your supporters as something other than voters, you know, that, that kind of thing. And it's, and once you claim them and co-opt them, a bunch of them peel off because they can see what's happening and they don't want to be used, but a lot of them stay, don't they? They do stay. And, and, and the problem is it's, it's the border has disappeared in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of the same players that were coming through Canada, um, they were also moving through the United States. We know who these actors are. I mean, I've had uh, several of these people I, I've tipped off to the Justice Department in the U.S. I mean, there are ongoing investigations on some of these same money laundering sources on the U.S. side of the border. There is an overarching, uh, there's multiple police investigations that I've been told, not just in this country, in the United States, but overseas as well. Yeah. So we are, uh, we're about to interest or, or, or uh, enter very interesting times politically. I think that this inquiry is uh, answering a lot of questions and connecting a lot of dots for Canadians. Um, and I think that more will come out. I think that uh, by the time we hear uh, about this uh, latest issue where uh, Premier Ford, well, basically committed an act that I, the notwithstanding clause is nothing more than a criminal act against every member of Ontario. It's uh, it's disgraceful. And um, But he I took the genie Trump. out of the bottle. He took the genie out of the bottle. And now every future premier, in my view, is probably going to use it. Absolutely. Or threaten, well, to, or threaten to use it either way. You know, he started it's funny because you don't see progressive premiers threatening to use the notwithstanding clause. It's, uh, and if know, they did, it would, be, it would be to force people to use the right pronouns. It wouldn't even be for the right fucking thing anyways, right? Like... You know, Probably. I'm not I making mean, fun that, of. That, I'm, that making, I'm, not go to, fun, right? I'm not making fun of pronoun people. I'm making fun of the politicians that feel like they need to placate to certain they demographics insult, in such a hardcore people. way. Yeah, they insult people. If you're gay, if you're lesbian, if you're trans, if you're black, if you're white, if you're, you're Canadian, why, why, why pigeonhole people? Talk about oh, well, them as Canadians. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but we'll leave, agree with that. We'll leave it there because you know to be uh, part of certain groups is a totally different experience. But I, I hear absolutely. you tonight, and I like. But, but at the end of the day, there are friends, there are neighbors, there are family, there are brothers and sisters, and they're yeah. Canadians. And I'm sorry, but they're part of my Canada. Bill Maher was talking. He was talking. It. And he was talking about this in the context of American politics with their midterms happening, and he was right. But it almost felt dated. The the sentence that he used and. That sentence was, um, the Democrats are going to lose because they cater too much to the woke. I'm paraphrasing now. And when people hear that, Bill Maher say that, there's there's two types of people. There's the type of people that receive it as intended, which is the fucking ridiculous, okay, we get it, dude. Like, you know, you, you want to make sure every syllable everyone says all the time is politically correct. And then there's the people that, that think, oh, Bill Maher doesn't understand the meaning of the word woke. No. Nope. Yeah, he does. It's just like every other fucking way. word. It gets a flexible definition. He's even an multiple entertainer. Definitions. No, but it gets multiple definitions. Woke became bastardized by the people that promote it the most. So at first it was actually from black culture. And it was like an expression used to know that even awareness of your situation in society as a black person. And it was your woke to the system and how it's worked together. That's where it came from. And then when, and then it got like sort of like stretched out to cover everything that's pretty much identity politics and, and progressive pull string politics and all that. But then it got to the point where it was so fucking ridiculous. Um, and I'm not even going to use any examples, so I can't paint myself into a corner where some idiot will say something idiotic. But, you know, they'll, they'll, it'll become one of these things where you just want them, that corner to shut up already because the louder that they are, the more the media is like, I guess this is what mainstream's doing right now. <laughs> they they want to. They're so afraid of the optics that they're like, okay, crazy woke people, not normal woke, but crazy woke. We'll do what you want us to do, and it's like, holy shit, do Black Lives Matter? I don't care what you think of anything, okay? Uh, other than the fact that you shouldn't be a racist piece of shit. When in 2020, when Black Lives Matter was doing their thing and protesting and all that and raising money, I had the audacity to say something like. Black Lives Matter as an expression, totally fitting. It's current. It means that we need to start focusing on the living experience of black people in the United States, especially as it pertains to their relationship with police. I totally get it. <clears throat> White Lives yeah, Matter. Especially when after one, one murders, murders a man, right? Yeah. Right in plain sight yeah. of the God and, right. and, and country. White Lives Matter signs, 
stupid as fuck. That's just the dumbest. Eh, you don't get it. But the organization, I, I, I don't like the organization. <coughs> and even some people that are listening to this right now are like, oh, here we go. Oh, why doesn't James like blah, blah, blah? I'll tell you why. Um, the same reason why I don't like the Libertarian Society of the United States or the communists of wherever, they are a stated Marxist organization. I'm not saying they shouldn't be what they want to be, but I'm not a Marxist. So why would I like I got news for you. Marxists at the top aren't Marxists either. I mean, that's that's yeah. good for the rank and file, not for them. Yeah. I don't know what that means, but um, you know. So anyways, back to Bill Maher. He, he was saying that the left shoot themselves in the foot and allow the Republicans, in this, his case, to win. And I felt like Trudeau did a lot of that. Um, I haven't seen too much of that lately, but I'm worried if he goes back to it for the next election that it will be the albatross that sinks him. It could be. It could be, unfortunately, because right now we're dealing with, of course, the aftermath and, well, the current wreckage of uh, COVID-19, and uh, had some very challenging times. Uh, financially, the world is in a mess. Um, we're in this strange, mushy middle where we can't move forward, we can't go back. And because they were the governing party when this hit, um, they'll probably catch a lot of the flack for the blame, um, which is completely out of anybody's control, a, a worldwide uh, situation like this. Um, What's really troubling to me is that politics haven't, uh, the, the conservatives used to bang the table and talk about the budget and bring costs under control. And that's something that every Canadian will be engaged in. Waste in government, um, but we're not talking about cutting waste. We're talking about cutting education, health care. But what really gets me is this dangerous tone that we have taken. We're taking organizations such as the World Economic Forum where people have been villainizing it. They're, people actually believe certain people, or at least propagate the belief that the WEF is populated by lizard people who have computer chips and vaccines, and uh, that uh, this is, people are eating veterinary grade pharmaceuticals yeah. to cure themselves. We live in a very strange time where, where this has got to stop. Because you know, can you imagine the future for our children? I mean, what are we going to do? Start sticking leeches on ourselves again? Where are we going with this? Probably to a fetish club. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. It, it is uh, it is kind of weird because I noticed when the pandemic started that um, I was seeing a lot more individual hosting uh, certain types of content. And then like six months later, I started seeing ads for that content. Like the new age industry psychics and crystals and all that kind of stuff has fucking exploded. Like, like people are turning to different things now to try to make sense of what they can't make sense. Like, like just as a funny metaphor, I bet you the suicide of Jeffrey Epstein created like 28,000 new Buddhists, Buddhists, you know, like, just because well, healing like crystals fucking, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, healing crystals are great, but uh, I, I don't know with COVID-19, I'd rather have a pharmaceutical solution personally. That's a spirally staircase for me, buddy. Um, but It's a messed uh, yeah. up thing on all around. But I mean, I think we have to take the uh, totality of the evidence and we have to let reason prevail. Because if we don't, we're going to be stuck in a world again where people are telling uh, school children during a worldwide pandemic to leave themselves unprotected. They're telling the general population to take horse pharmaceuticals. They're uh, preaching about evil alien beings at the World Economic Forum. I'm sorry, but, and they say that I have a problem. I, I, I'll just leave that out there. Yeah, it's funny because- um, Lizard people, you know, James. Lizard I know, people. I know the David Icke stuff, right? Like the uh, reptilians, I think they call them. Um, yes. And there's like three or four different races of reptilians that are all here kind of like- I don't know, maybe we could call up the Alberta Premier. She could give us a rundown on the roster of lizard people. They probably just mean ex wrestlers it could be who knows you can't you can't reason with crazy no but you know what you know what's funny i would interview david ike you know sure, i would say i mean he's got oh yeah oh thank you by the way for, for saying that because I, I am getting really tired of of get, getting emails and messages and tweets or whatever from people who were like i can't believe you platformed that person and i'm just like platforming used to be called interviews 
And yes. we interviewed Osama bin Laden and we interviewed tyrants that like lead like third world countries and fucking people that uh, give guns to kids in Africa. Yeah. Like we fucking interview these people because they're the like dungeon dark side of history and we want to hear it from their mouths. And someone's just like, I can't believe someone with those important. Why yeah, not? He's entertaining. Like, I mean, fuck. He's entertaining. It's not even the entertainment so part. It's not even the entertaining part. It's just like, like where are we? Like, you know, I, I would interview anyone anyone i don't like except boring completely unknown people but i mean as far as like heinous evil people that are well known i, didn't I think you should get danielle smith and david ike on together she'd probably end up making him the minister of alien affairs yeah it'd be if something just burst out of her chest <laughs> it's just like okay you know we had trump as president so anything's possible anything's possible and i mean it's uh, i i just uh I, I just think there's some really dangerous messaging going on right now. And uh, Alberta is setting itself up as an outlaw state. And uh, that's never good for anybody. I mean, there are a lot of hardworking, brilliant Albertans who deserve better. They deserve uh, whatever government it is, whatever party it is. They deserve government, not scandal after scandal after scandal after scandal. Yeah, you know what? Um, someone I just saw someone sort of mention this man's name in the comments. And uh, the whole thing with brethren stuff, th the fact that they're in like five, six, whatever countries, and that they get so many government contracts, why aren't more people in those countries like saying to government and reporters, the leader of this group is seen as a present day living deity mm -hmm. that he like hangs with Jesus and then verbatim types out what Jesus just told him verbatim mm -hmm. and then shares that with the flock who believe him and then send, him, of, and then send him envelopes of cash. Yeah, it sounds reasonable. Sounds reasonable. Just, but I'm the, I'm the con man, they say, not this dime store cowboy. Let's Let's get it straight. The head of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church is not a, uh, um, a living deity. He's not the doorway to God. What he is like, is a like mafia he, don, the head of a criminal organization yeah. that steals money from uh, the victims in his cult. Um, yeah. They use shady influence to get government contracts, and they engage in criminal activity on an international scope. That's what they are. Right. So they should be designated as some sort of like like terrorist like, organization. They're domestic. Uh, that's terrorists. a little far, probably. Like that. No, know, it's like, not. They. they I, I would. I would, I would lean more towards Canadian citizens. Come on. Yeah, but uh, fra I mean, the violence itself that is perpetrated by terrorist groups has to have a religious or political agenda, and I believe their agenda is almost primarily financial. Right, and, but they weaponize, but they weaponize the yes. faith against their own flock. They Absolutely. manipulate the belief of them, <laughs> and then they're like, oh, "Okay, these people believe in me. Oh, well, then great. Uh, start sending envelopes of money. Start shielding people accused of raping children. Yes. Right. Start um, volunteering uh, at, at you know volunteer firefighters things or whatever, giving out food." Um, for, for good PR reasons, even though you would never even eat with them or touch them because they're, they're not brethren. Like, is it, this must be a failure of media. It has to be. Because I do not see a story like that. Like, actually, uh, to be fair, they covered it in the, uh, extensively here and there in places like the UK, Australia, a little bit in New Zealand. But Canada? We have not. Like, aside from Alex uh, Rodriguez, no. Um, the, the guy that did the documentary Alex, uh, from breaking breaking brethren uh, breaking brethren Alex name doesn't come to mind now but he did a wonderful job he totally did um and I don't think I've seen any other any other uh report that is extensive about about the brethren like I, I it, it's shocking to me and you know it has one of those you know I don't know it's Alex McIntosh and I don't know Excellent. you know what the answer is as to why, like, I mean, there's people that go down the conspiracy theory hole and are like, the cult's connected to all the networks. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, but, you know, isn't the present day Jesus enough for for someone to want to take a look? I don't know. It's, uh, 
You so there was like, are we so reason. beholden to the for, for of freedom of expression? Are we so beholden to freedom of religion that we'll look past something like that? Like Bruce Hale should have to prove in court that he talks to Jesus. Well, I'm sure he talks to somebody, but it's uh, yeah. uh, that might be evidence of his uh, mental illness. But uh, I seriously think that the only conversations uh, Mr. Hales has about his God is when he's speaking with his investment manager. Yeah. Or his prostitute. Or his prostitute. Well, that's allegedly. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. If, I mean, he doesn't look like a fit man. I doubt that. He's I have a that. sneaking suspicion that this cult leader might be a tad hypocritical about his beliefs. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say that right now he's wearing a gimp suit um, and there are several people in a room and none of them have clothes on. So I think I will tell you, this guy's probably going to send a team to your house. You understand that, right? A team of what? Hey, be nice. can you come in and talk to us? Yeah, it'll be like a team of <laughs> I, I, would, I would talk to them, actually. If they out of control, uh, be like, yeah, out of control dance music would start playing. Give you pamphlets. What's that? Like the, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses banging on your door trying to give you pamphlets, except this time they slap you around a bit, too. I have a great, a great history with the Jehovah's Witnesses when I lived in Parkdale. Just great. Like, I got to know this couple. Uh, not a couple, like a romantic couple, but these this man and this woman. And they came to my house the first time and I told them, here's the rule. We will go in, I'll give you some tea. We can talk about whatever you want to talk about, but you're never allowed to use an argument that starts with the Bible says. Oof, and the first time they came over, they it. lasted like three minutes. And I'm like, I'll see you guys later. And we see later. came, a week later they came, it was like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. But they got frustrated with me because I just kept on asking for evidence of the crazy ass shit that they claimed. So <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I think, yeah. are they the one that they say, uh, their, their fine and fearless leader looked into a hat and pulled out something. I can't remember how that worked. I, I don't know. I, I think those were Mormons. Probably sound about right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, he pulled it out of his ass. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, but let's, I, I, I've been saying, like, let's make, let's make Bruce Hales famous. That's what I want to do. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, with your help, um, the fix, we don't have a date set for the launch yet uh, for the fix, but we know it's basically mid to third week in November, whatever, something like that. Uh, um, but I am so, yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. It, I'm looking going forward to, to it. It's not just one curtain. It's not no. just one curtain. Oh, here it is. It's like, here's a curtain over here that shows you that. Here's a curtain over here that shows you that. All these little peepholes kind of thing. And Absolutely. that's what's fascinating about it to me. The the volume of rat fucking and bagman shit and private investigations and blackmail and all that that happens every single election or leadership campaign is astounding. It is. You know? So um, I can't wait to do this. David Wallace, thank you again for joining us. Uh, you'll probably be back next week and we'll be talking about three or four other Klondike cl paper stories. Most <laughs> likely, I'm assuming. Tally ho. We're going to be able to recognize the facial expression of reporters who are like trying to make the facial expression. I know, but it seems true. They're just like trying to be impartial. Um, and I'm loving every second of it. So congratulations on being vindicated on like numerous things that you said on this show and on Dean Blundell um, that has come true over the last few months. Um, Justin Ling, I believe was calling you a conspiracy theorist for those things. Uh, and the Pied Piper that may have been spreading the idea that the Klondike Papers were some dossier of cabals and government. Well, I certainly am a Pied Piper because I'm leading these scumbags out and hopefully out the very deep water where they drown. Um, when we do the podcast, we're going to remove the word scumbag from your lexicon. Okay, so 1985. these gentlemen of uh, questionable <laughs> reputation. I'm going to get these scumbags, James. We're going to do it right now. But first, Red Bull. It'd be great. That's it. First Red Bull. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I always love having you on. Thank you for coming. Uh, we'll have you again soon. I'll probably just talk to you after I get off the podcast. All right, buddy. Excellent. Look forward to it. David Wallace. Um, also, I'm, I'm starting to get really groggy. Uh, <laughs> just sort of holding it together. As soon as I get off this podcast, I'm going to sleep. But there is a... Uh, I'm really happy for him. You know, the state of mind that he was in a few times over the last six months because of all the weight that was coming down on him, <clears throat> just pleading with everyone saying, I'm telling you the truth and, and nothing really happening in the mainstream stuff that uh, I think 
vindication is kind of where he's at right now. Um, and hopefully he can continue to do the kind of work that started off this transition for him, which was protecting Richard Marsh from the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. Like that was his first domino to a new life of <clears throat> not shady shit. And I think he understands that the formula then for him is to be kind of like the Robin Hood, you know, where he takes um, corrupt people and, and shakes them by the ankles and we get to see all the corruption fall out and then he just rides away. Like, I like that. I'm really kind of excited about this chapter of work and, pull, you know, like we have a, we have a personal, rela- I've never met him in flesh, but we have like, we know each other. He's so interesting, you know, um, but he's one of those guys where it's like, do you invest that much of a friendship in David Wallace? Because you would not be surprised if you woke up and turn on the news and just, he was dating like the daughter of a king in Malaysia. Oh yeah, yeah. David probably did a job for his cousin. <laughs> you know, it's just like, but um, no, but that's what I like about him. He's really interesting. So David Wallace is starting the fix date to be determined. And uh, I can't wait for that. And since my voice is now almost completely gone, I'm starting to sound like Tim Dog, DaCosta, you know what I mean. <clears throat> I'm going to go, and we'll see you next time on Black Ball. Black Ball. Black, black, black Ball. Black, 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 black Ball. Black, 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 black Ball.